Coming up, third class medical reform is expected to progress next week. We'll tell you what will go forward and why patience is still a virtue. Plus, flying with Patty Wagstaff, a Goonie bird with a Tinseltown past, and why it's important to always track that center line. AOP Live this week begins in just a moment. As far as the verb camera goes, it's the solution. We've used every other action camera and we've thrown them all away or given them away because now we have five verbs and they're all over our airplanes and we wouldn't use anything else. Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. We're glad you're spending part of your holiday with us. I'm Tom Haynes. This is AOPA Live This Week. If you sat down to Thanksgiving dinner with a bunch of pilots, it's a safe bet that third class medical reform would probably come up in that conversation. We continue to get questions and comments from members like you. And here to answer some of those questions is advocacy expert Melissa Rudinger. And Melissa, members are online and other ways letting us know that medical reform seems to, in their opinions, maybe lost uh, a little bit of steam, although there's still a lot of interest out there. What's that all about? There's a lot of interest, not only with our members, but also with members of Congress. In fact, um, as it stands now, there are 180 co-sponsors in Congress and it has bipartisan support. We know many of you are left asking, well, then why isn't something happening? Well, it is, and as far as anything with the government is concerned, it's actually happening pretty quick, but it won't happen by the end of the year. It's, uh, the lame duck session is only gonna last uh, for about a week in December, and there are a number of larger issues, one being uh, funding the federal government uh, for the next fiscal year. So uh, uh, we're not gonna see third class medical reform done uh, in this calendar year, uh, but one on a positive note this year, uh, the Department of Transportation is expected to release its uh, review of the uh, FAA's proposed uh, rule, uh, and then where now it will go to uh, OMB hopefully uh, in early December. And according to the online calendar, the DOT is expected to be finished with reviewing the rulemaking on the third class medical reform sometime in the next few days. From there, it goes to the Office of Management and Budget for a review, and that will take about 90 days. So sometime around March, we will know what the FAA's proposed rules will say. That still leaves the legislative options in play, but this is a lame duck Congress, and with a new one seated in January, we will still have most of the supporters. When Congress uh, convenes in January, uh, we'll start anew. We'll start anew on the legislative front for certain, uh, and we will push uh, for third-class medical reform, both uh, on the regulatory side and on the legislative side. And uh, quite frankly, whichever comes first is what we're going to gra grab for. So that, along with the fact that next year is uh, the FAA reauthorization uh, bill that comes up, normally comes up about every four years, as you know. And uh, that, that, that law, is it's massive. It covers all the programs administered by the FAA. It sets the, the FAA's budget and priorities for spending. And so we'll be heavily involved in that. I also anticipate that there will be uh, standalone legislation uh, introduced uh, uh, next year. And uh, we'll be pushing for that as well. And if we can't get that moved through Congress separately, we'll work uh, as hard as we can to get that included in the FA reauthorization bill. So the efforts are not going away. And all the work that's been put into this so far isn't a waste. And it's actually happening, as I said, pretty quickly, at least as far as the federal government's concerned. It's taken too long. There's, there's no doubt about it. But from where we started uh, and where we are today, it, it's light years in, in government terms. And the bottom line, this is a priority for AOPA. It's been a priority all year. We really started pushing it, and we are really getting close to some common sense medical certification regulations to be put in place for general aviation pilots. Okay, so we'll just hang on a little bit longer. Hang on. All right. Another highly debated issue by pilots is the use of drones in the national airspace system. There have been numerous reports in the past week by airline pilots of near misses at commercial airports, especially New York's Kennedy. More officially known as UAS, Unmanned Aerial Systems, the FAA is a, scheduled to release a proposed rule soon regulating the commercial use of small UAS. At the moment, it's illegal to use them for commercial use with a few exceptions. 
Now, the Wall Street Journal this week speculated that the proposed rule would require the operator to be a pilot and may limit many small commercial drone operations to be below 400 feet and within line of sight. So, Melissa, uh, what is it that you're hearing uh, down at the FAA? Is that jive? Well, I don't like to speculate on what's in a proposed rule, but what I can tell you is that over the past few years, I've personally represented AOPA member interests in various working groups uh, tasked with developing proposed rules to safely integrate small commercial UAS into the national airspace system. And I can tell you that AOPA has been consistent in telling the FAA that to integrate UAS into the system, the rules must ensure that they are operated safely and compatibly with other users. As a general policy, for commercial UAS operating in, in airspace where GA flies, AOPA believes the operator should meet a certification standard, the UAS should meet a certification standard, and the UAS should be flown in compliance with current operating rules and airspace requirements. We believe the level of certification should be appropriate to the type of air operation being conducted, and just like in GA, we don't want the FAA to take a heavy-handed approach, but instead scale its regulations to accommodate UAS without jeopardizing the safety of general aviation and efficiency of general aviation. All right, so in other words, it's going to be a little while before the Amazon drone shows up at my door with a Christmas package, right? I wouldn't be looking for it this Christmas. <laughs> okay, well, maybe one of these days soon. Meanwhile, AOPA outreach and event staff are finalizing plans for our 2015 AOPA regional fly-ins. One of the remarkable things about the events is that they attract an incredible variety of aircraft. AOPA pilot editor Ian Twombly found one that stands out for its size. The DC-3 is a monument in aviation history. It memorializes the beginning of fast, affordable commercial travel. As a C-47, it served in World War II as a means to carry cargo and troops anywhere duty called. Lance Tolan's 1945 model is a prime example of the DC-3's legendary past. The airplane was a Canadian airplane, and um, it was built during World War II in 1945. Ninety-five percent of all these rivets were pushed in by women at the uh, factory in Santa Monica. And after the um, airplane was delivered to Canada, it went on to Europe uh, and, and served with the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. In 1986, the airplane served as an ambassador, celebrating 50 years of the DC-3 as it flew around the world, painted in Odyssey 86 livery. It later was repainted for a Hollywood appearance. Well, Algonquin Airlines, if you see that, and on the other side it says Everlast Airlines, uh, it was in a John Travolta movie, uh, and it was used as a prop, and we also did some flying in the movie, and uh, those are fictitious airline names. Lance has a personal history with DC-3s. He had the opportunity to fly one before he even had his private certificate. Lance was invited on a training flight as he was washing the landing gear on a DC-3. He ended up in the left seat and got a surprise when he returned. He said, where's your logbook? And I said, it's in my car. He said, well, get it so I can sign your first dual cross country off in a DC-3. So I thought that was kind of cool. Now Lance enjoys his DC-3 memories and the experience flying a piece of history. This is where I started in aviation. I don't ride motorcycles. This is my Harley Davidson. Fly it about 50 hours a year. Lance wants his airplane to not just be a symbol of the past, but to bring the love of flying to future generations. The doors open on it. There's not a do not touch sign on it. I guess today we probably had 1,200 people through the airplanes, and all the kids got to go in there, feel it, touch it, smell it, and no one told them no. Ian Twombly, AOPA Live. Thanks, Ian. Cool old airplane. In the coming weeks, we'll have a wrap-up of the year of fly-ins, then look for where we are going to be next year in the February edition of AOPA Pilot Magazine. We're getting new details this week about the Chicago Center fire. The FAA has released a 30-day review of the fire and the investigation into security protocol. The report says the incident underscores the need for funding, flexibility, and the next-gen airspace modernization. AOPA reported extensively on the controllers who had to make do during the hours and days after the incident. You can see a report on AOPA.org. Just search ATC Zero. Well, coming up after the break, find out how you can take a flight with Patty Wagstaff and why must we worry about the center line. You're watching AOPA Live this week. We're back before you can get that plate of leftovers.
Welcome back to AOPA Live this week. We're thankful you're sharing your holiday with us. Well, there's another way you can share with AOPA. The AOPA Foundation has an online auction and there's some amazing things you can bid on. One of them is caught up in a bidding war as we tape this. The hot item? An upset recovery training flight with aerobatic superstar Patty Wagstaff. You can forget all about straight and level with this one. Patty will take you up for a flight in an extra 300L in St. Augustine, Florida. Follow up the excitement by having dinner with Patty if you're still up for that. As of this taping, the bidding on this item is well into five figures. But there are some other items there that are within most of our budgets. Just announced this week are several things from CFI superstar Rod Machado and a Tailwheel endorsement program. The auction isn't your thing. You can participate in Giving Tuesday. It's a global day dedicated to giving back and celebrating generosity, which is what the holiday season is all about, right? This year, Giving Tuesday is on December 2nd. The AOPA Foundation would sure love to have your support. Text the letters GA, that's G-A, to the number 27722, 27722, to make a $10 donation to the AOPA Foundation. It's just that easy. When prompted, reply to confirm your donation. Your $10 will help ensure a strong future for general aviation flying in the future. There are things you're taught to do in life, whether you want to do them or not, like brush your teeth, never spit into the wind, always track the center line is one of those as well. Some of life's lessons are obvious, but AOPA pilot senior editor Dave Hirschman explains what's so right about being in the center. What's the big deal about the white stripe? Why do flight instructors insist on tracking the center line, even on big, wide runways? Is it so wrong to touch down a little bit left or right of center? In truth, there's really no harm in a little sloppiness in the vast majority of the takeoffs and landings we make. But sometimes, somewhere, you'll find yourself challenged by a narrow strip, a strong crosswind, or an unforeseen situation that makes precision really matter. And that's the time you'll be glad that you focused on improving your accuracy in your preceding flights. Practice refines your skills to the point that putting your airplane exactly where you want it becomes a habit. You'll notice small deviations while they're still small and correct them long before they become critical. You'll fly with more confidence knowing that you can meet your own high standards, even, perhaps especially, in tough conditions. So the next time you're taking off or landing at your home airport in calm winds, challenge yourself. Do your best to keep your airplane's main landing gear astride the white stripe. It's just a game, but someday it'll be for real. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. Thanks, Dave. Look like some of those landings might be just a few millimeters off. We're a tough crowd here. Holiday shopping season is here, and for one space buff, Christmas may have come early. The flight manual used by Commander Gene Kranz during the moon landing of Apollo 11 was auctioned off this week. It includes schedules, status checks, and a handwritten abort checklist. The one-of-a-kind piece of history sold for nearly $92,000. What a remarkable piece of history. We're glad you've shared some of your week with us. Hopefully you have the chance to spend some time with those important to you this week and maybe even get a little flying in. We're all thankful to have you as a viewer. We'll leave you this week with some more footage from the wingtip of Patty Wagstaff. Thanks for watching. I'm Tom Haynes. See you next week.